today's your last class. After a week, he would be having a party last <laughs> of some kind, I'm sure. Uh, um, the plan for today is that we will spend about some time, little time, wrapping up, talking about what we talked about so far in the last three months, two and a half months. Then we'll take a break and talk about what you want to talk about, which is you know, exam, logistics of any kind. And then uh, we will do evaluations. And then, whatever time we have remaining, in that time, I'm going to talk about uh, a research project that I'm involved with, just for fun. The, the reason I chose that research project is that you will see some of the things that you learned in this course showing up in that project. So you will see how, in my particular scenario, how I was able to use what we learned in Right. So that's the plan. We'll see how much we are able to do. We don't have to cover everything. For example, you can just get rid of the last part of the class uh, if you're not interested. Okay, so let's get started. Technically, I should have done this lecture right after the first lecture, but I thought that we should do some concepts, and you know, we'll come back to it at some point, and I never got a chance to. So this is our chance to actually just think about it in the context of stuff that we have already learned. So it's just yes, it makes sense. Is what I would. Hope you will see. Yeah, of course. I know this already. Sort of. So we are going to talk about agents, intelligent agents, artificial agents, and the reason we are going to talk about agents is because that is the typical manifestation of AI in reality. Now, in based on whatever research has happened, based on different views of AI, based on everything, now people believe that if you want to show intelligence or AI, you should show it through an agent. We'll talk about what is the objective function of the agent. We'll talk about what are the different kinds of agents, different kinds of environments they may be acting in, and what is the processing they are doing internally in their brain, which is the AI component. So <coughs> this may not be new. This will not be new information to you, for sure. So an agent is anything that can be viewed as perceiving its environment through sensors and acting in that environment through effectors or actuators. Another word we use for that, actions. Right. Another word we use for sensors, observations. Right. So same thing. So we are agents. The reason we are agents is that we have eyes, ears, uh, skin for getting in feedback, for getting in the environment to look at the environment to, the, these, are, these are sensors. And then we have effectors. We have arms, we, we can punch somebody, or we have mouth, we can talk, I can talk. So um, these are our actuators. So therefore, we are an agent. And any agent, an agent doesn't need to be an artificial agent. It can be a natural agent like me, and you. And it can be an artificial agent like, for example, a robotic agent, which has cameras and laser range finders and all, all these gadgets for sensors. And then it will have various <coughs> motors and arms and you know all of those things that it can control as actuators. Nothing changes. It's the same thing. The agent need not be physical. It can be a soft bot, a robotic agent which, uh, which is present on the, on in, inside the computer as opposed to in a physical world. So you know any of these medical diagnosis systems would be agents. Or the one that you just constructed is actually an agent. You ask the agent, you know, uh, I see these observations. The agent takes in that observations, does some processing and tells you these are the possible diagnoses. That's an agent. Yeah, many of these websites, technically Google is an agent. You say, okay, you say uh, this is my query, uh, I want to find information related to this particular keyword or these, this, this kind of information need I have, and it searches through its thing, whatever, and comes back with an answer. That's its, uh, it's an agent. Buildings can be agents. Buildings are intelligent. As soon as I go out, the light goes off. Or some, I get a beep, your wallet is inside the room, you have forgotten your wallet. You can add more and more intelligence in it. The point is that all of these things are examples of agents. <coughs> and as we just said, an agent is constantly acting in some environment. It sees, or it senses, and it performs the actions. And the actions change the environment in one way or the other. Um, and often the goal of the agent internally is to implement a mapping from this observation to an action so that it knows what it needs to do. And the reason it does this is because it is optimizing something and that optimization is performance measure. So these are the characteristics of an agent. One, the sensors. Two, the effectors. 
Three, the mapping from observation sequence to action or some kind of a decision making system. And four, a performance measure that it is trying to optimize for this particular problem. Okay. Yes. Okay. You haven't really distinguished this from, say, classic control theory. It's just, this looks just like closed loop control. Yeah. Software. So what makes it, what makes AI different than control? Why should AI be different than control? So it's the same. Really. There's no difference. The only difference, <coughs> First of all, the goal is the same. The manifestation and the way of thinking about it is somewhat different. And the reason is that when people do control theory, they, they come from a different background. They are not excited by the philosophy of intelligence. They are excited by the actual machine. Typically, control theory will not be dealing with softbots, typically. Uh, AI will typically be dealing with uh, discrete state spaces. But as you will see later in, the, in this particular lecture, that AI is about problems. So to us, a control theory problem is also an AI problem. We will use their techniques to solve the intelligence problem for the control. I mean, it, there's no difference. It sort of starts to become. So if you are motivated by the philosophy, you are doing AI. If you're solving the problem and not motivated by the philosophy, you are still doing AI, you may not know it. <laughs> is how I will characterize it. But, but I have an AI-centric view. Um, now, the more interesting thing is what is a rational agent, right? So we have been talking about what is intelligence. And one definition of intelligence or intelligent agent would be an agent which is quote unquote rational. Now what is rational? <clears throat> a rational agent is one which tries to do the right thing, intuitively, right? Um, but it tries to do the right thing based on what? Based on its information. So based on what it has perceived, what actions it can perform, what it knows. And in order to make it more explicit, we define some kind of a performance measure, an objective criteria. Now, people may not have a very well-defined objective criteria of how they are acting. Uh, there is some notion of rationality, I think, in people also, because we have some value of emotion and we have some value to things that we can't make it explicit. The only thing in intelligent agent is, in artificial intelligent agent, is that we will clearly, explicitly define the performance measure that we want to optimize. And so we can easily track our ability to become be intelligent in the context of the performance measure that we are optimizing. So this is sort of the ideal version of the rational agent. For each possible percept sequence or observation sequence, it does whatever action is expected to optimize its performance measure on the basis of evidence perceived so far, and only that, and its built-in knowledge. So if there's something that is hidden from the agent, it is not supposed to know it, then it doesn't need to uh, take into account that while making its decision. Right? It makes its best decision based on its knowledge. So there is a trade-off between rationality and omniscience. Uh, if for an omniscient agent, an agent that knows everything, the, the rational action may be different. But for an agent that doesn't know those inf that information, an action may be very different. For example, sometimes an agent may act in order to obtain information. And we have seen some examples of that already, right? We talked about exploration exploitation trade-off. The reason we have exploration is because the agent does not know the model of the world. And so it explores in order to gain that model and then later uses that information in order to make its decisions. Right? Then there's a notion of bounded rationality. Now this, this becomes a little more computational. Because yes, an ideal agent is expected to optimize its performance measure. We know that really, in practice, all the problems that we study are at least NP hard. Otherwise, you know, theory guys can solve that for us. So why? That's because, uh, I mean, that's how it has been. But more importantly, our optimization function can be complicated, and we may not be able to solve it. If we can't solve it, that means we cannot achieve rationality. If we can't achieve rationality, or at least ideal rationality, then how do we define, how do we find that our agent is intelligent or not? So we define this notion of bounded rationality, which says that we have a performance measure. We, given our state, we have to choose the optimal action. But given limited computational resources. Now, if you connect this to all the experiments or all the assignments that we have done, at least the first two assignments, it will suddenly start to make sense to you. You have one minute 
see the best you can do and then we'll figure out which assignment or which person's agent is the more intelligent agent. Now it makes sense. These are NP hard problems. If I gave you, you know, 100 days, you might be able to find me a better solution. But you know, that is not practical. So let's make it practical. We have to make a decision under some time constraints or under some resource constraints or some kind of constraints. And so we cannot achieve ideality, ideal rationality. We want to still figure out a an objective function that is achievable, that helps us define who, what is more intelligent, what is not. So we'll use bounded rationality. Rationality that is bounded in the context of the limitation given to us by the resource constraints. So you actually built intelligent agents in your first assignment, in your second assignment, because you had this problem that I have only so much time at hand. Bounded rationality. Okay, <clears throat> what are different kinds of agents, right? So different kinds of agents will be those which will have different uh, performance measures, different environments, different actuators, different sensors, right? So for any intelligent agent design, we should first specify these four criteria. It's called PEAS or PEACE, definition of an agent. So for example, this is the explanation for say an automated taxi driver. You know, we all know about self-driving cars, <coughs> right? So this is now very much a reality, although when this was conceived, when this chapter was written, that was not a reality. But that that's always happens in AI. We dream and then mankind catches up. So, um, that's true for science fiction also, by the way. Um, so, automated taxi driver. So, what are the performance measures? Well, you want to be safe and not kill people. Um, you still want to, you know, maximize the, uh, reduce the time, so you should be fast. You should be legal. You should not be, you know, jumping around and driving through uh, parks and, you know, whatever, random places, uh, or through people's homes. Maybe there is some objective function on that the trip should be com comfortable for people, maybe less important, I don't know. Um, uh, and and eventually, if you have too many of these uh, taxi drivers, then you want to maximize your total profit or maximize your profit or whatever. Right, so those are some kind of performance measures and you'll have to define one performance measure, which is a combination of all of these. The environment is the roads, the traffic, pedestrians, customers, whatever. Your actuators are the steering wheel, accelerator, brake, and so on. And your sensors is whatever sensors these cars will have, like, you know, uh, cameras and speedometers and so on. So this is a description of an intelligent, uh, of an agent, doesn't have to be intelligent as, as much as I've defined, an agent which is driving cars or cars. <coughs> now let's do medical diagnosis, the one that you have been doing. What is my performance measure? Well, I want my patient to be healthy, I want to minimize my costs, uh, maybe of, uh, uh, of uh, tests and operations and medicines. At the same time, if you're a real hospital, you know that what is more important than saving a person's life is to not have lawsuits, mm. right? So, so that is your performance measure, probably. Uh, the environment is obviously patient, hospital, and staff. Uh, actuators are, you know, uh, <clears throat> getting in information, right? So maybe you're just getting information from keyboard or by, you know, people uh, typing it out for you or whatever it is. And your sensors, um, Sorry, I'm sorry, your actuators are telling what should you do. So what are the possible diagnoses? What are the questions that you may be asking? What are the tests or treatments one should do? And your sensors are the information that you're getting in, like the symptoms or, you know, test findings. Quick side note, there was an article tonight at the New York Times talking about uh, medical diagnosis and computers and how we haven't yet been humans there. They were talking about this doctor who's still better than any Yeah, and it, it's, it's a... Uh, it's trickier than that. The reason is that, you know, I think we talked about it 15, 20 years back, Microsoft had a real functioning medical diagnosis system which was shut down, not because it was not performing well, but for political reasons. And the political reasons come from hospitals, the political reason comes from who is responsible if the system makes an incorrect prediction, the political reason comes from a lot of places. So, in fact, it has been told to me that different big companies have tried to get into the space and pretty much always this happens. Now, I, don't quote me on this because I don't have all the information and all the sort of scoop here. But the point is that I would say that it is not just the technology that is uh, uh, not making us successful in medical diagnosis. I think the technology, if we try hard enough, is already present because we have been collecting a lot of data for a long period of time. And this data, as soon as we start mining it, we will have a lot of useful information. That is my perspective. Somebody has one. So in the my machine learning class, one of the whether the models are easy to, for humans to read, read them on. Yes. It seems like in a medical diagnosis system, you want 
something where you understood why it was doing a particular right. thing. As opposed to having a neural net or something where it just spit Yeah, this is a beautiful things. discussion that you know maybe we should have or maybe not. But uh, so one of okay. There's one thing about whether the system makes the right prediction. The other thing is whether the system can explain to the doctor what the right prediction is. The third thing is even before you employ the system, you have to talk to some people, you have to explain your algorithm and make them convinced that yes, we can actually use this. I have been told that people who actually do medical diagnosis or try to uh, push the medical diagnosis into hospitals are trying to deal with people who do not really understand uh, technology or computer science very well. So you, they, don't, they are not comfortable with set probability value. They are just not. So it, uh, I, I remember having this conversation with a guy who works on cancer research and how to um, plan tumors, uh, radiation, and so on. He said that whenever he tries to talk to these people, these doctors, they say, "What is this P in the decision tree?" And you know, because they can't get an intuition of this, they start believing that it's magic. I mean, a black box or something that they can't trust. And this doesn't happen just in medical diagnosis. So, for example, the Mars rover problem that we talked about, Andre probably talked about in the classical planning lecture. Uh, where they had to, the planning folks, the AI folks had to convince uh, the operations people who are running Mars rover on Mars to use their planner. And the operations folks said, you know, you AI folks, you know, you, are, you do some, some kind of thing that we don't understand. We can't trust such an expensive piece of equipment or piece of robot in your hands. And so there was a lot of political game that happened in AI folks trying to convince the uh, operations folks said, let please use our techniques because they're actually really good. You know, you're saving a lot of, you, we will save a lot of human effort, we will save a lot of scientific, we will gain a lot of scientific value. And so eventually the way they did it is that they said, we have created this software for you, it's enabled. This is the button to disable it. <laughs> there is a lot of possibility, it will produce a plan for you, you can tweak it, you can change it, you can rewrite it, you can disable us. Okay, but take it. And they finally took it, and they have never disabled it. They tweak it, but they have never disabled it. Which is saying that AI does give really good starting points where from where some more human intuition can act. So there is a complex story in making the technology transfer from technology into reality. And sometimes it's easier in the case of Google. Now you can't think of web search without learning, without AI. You cannot. That just doesn't make sense. It's not database. It's not the keyword matching anymore. It's just a complicated machinery There's, that goes into web search. There's learning that goes into web search. There's personalization that goes into web search. We have accepted it because we started from something where nothing was ex existing. Right? There was nothing there. The web was a very new phenomenon. New things could be tried. Now everybody's seeing the value of it, and nobody questions the use of something that they don't understand. And they're talking about things that play with people's lives and so on. And huge history of uh, doctors and medicine and no tests, no uh, 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 real uh, studies which are showing things. I mean, uh, um, I don't think I can recreate this argument, but this guy was making the argument that in medical profession, almost no um, these uh, trials give you any conclusive useful information. They just, they just beat some null hypothesis which is extremely weak. And so on. So really, we haven't learned much. We don't learn very much by clinical trials. A because finding patients for trials is very hard, and and so on and so on. So really, we are the whole medicine field is probably based on not very strong fundamental mathematical machinery, but it's working, and we are used to it. And uh, people are afraid of getting technology into the picture. Now, obviously, technology will make mistakes here. There were doctors make mistakes. Anyway. I don't think we should go too much into this discussion, but really getting AI into practice is a challenge that is outside the scope of our course. Uh, you are enabled to do it, but in order to get into it into the real world, you may have to deal with things that I can't teach you, and I don't even know how to uh, do that because I've never uh, rarely done those things. But let's talk about pro properties of environments, which is much easier for me to teach. <laughs> so what are different kinds of environments? Well, environments can be observable, like I know completely, fully observable, partially observable. I know parts of the state split, but don't know parts of the state split. Deterministic or stochastic, we know this very well now. Episodic or sequential, one shot, I do something, I'm done, or you know, one step, the next step, the next step, long. What my objective, uh, environment can be static, so it doesn't change if I don't touch it, right? Like solitaire. 
all dynamic, you know, things change and I, I didn't do anything but things still change, which is real world. Semi-dynamic, which means that uh, the environment is static but my performance measure depends on time. So like in timed chess, nothing changes until I change it or an agent changes it but time is running and so my total score that I can get is reducing. Discrete, which is typically what AI folks do, but that's not no longer true, at least in the last 10, 15 years, we, we do a lot of continuous stuff also. Single agent versus multi-agent, right? Now, what are these multiple agents? They can be cooperative, like all these robots trying to find people who are buried in an earthquake uh, disaster, or competitive, like, you know, they are fighting against each other in the game of chess, or self-interested, where they have their own uh, utility functions. Sometimes they may collaborate, just because both of them gain value, but most often, you know, they're just looking out for themselves and there's nothing else. Most people, I think, are sort of in this uh, real, or, yeah, more or less. Uh, right? So now, uh, say, robotic soccer versus chess. What are the differences, right? So in, uh, in chess, we are talking about a static environment, or semi-dynamic at most, Deterministic environment, observable, discrete, sequential, and multi-agent. On the other hand, in a robotic environment, the environment is dynamic, the, uh, uh, the world is stochastic, almost nothing is fully observable, it's very continuous, uh, it is definitely sequential and multi-agent. So, a, a robo-soccer is a much more complex environment. Therefore. And, you know, people are, that is why we haven't made that much progress, but you know that's why uh, if we make such progress, it will be really satisfying. Johnson, if, if we're talking about several single autonomous agents that interact, are we still considering a multi-agent model, or are we considering a single agent model? Right. So, again, in multi-agent uh, uh, AI, there are a lot of things that you have to think about. So, first of all, there are many single agents. Where are, where are they making a decision? Is there a centralized server that is making a decision? <coughs> is the decision making decentralized? How is the information sharing happening? Is one agent independently telling another agent some information that this agent has? Or is everybody telling their information up, that information comes back to everyone and then they make their own decisions? So there are a lot of things that we have to uh, study when we have to start thinking about, say, planning in multiple agents or you know, just, just the process of communication. What should I communicate? When should I communicate? is challenging, right? Um, I don't know if I answered your question. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I'm just asking about the terminology. Yeah. Multi -agent. Mul multiple agents. Uh, Do we mean that they have one central mothership that's coordinating them? Necessarily? No, not necessarily. Right, and there are many, many other examples you can have a look at. I should also, uh, I also want to talk about the agent and what it is doing internally, right? So, what is an artificially intelligent agent doing internally? So, it can be a simple reflexive agent. What does that mean? It means that <coughs> it has an environment, it is getting some sensors. And the sensors are telling it some information about how the world is. And that, and it has some, some table, some policy table, some rules somewhere, which are mapping the observations to an actions, and then it is taking those actions. This is a reflexive agent. As soon as I touch a hot stove or a hot gas, I take my hand off. What am I doing? I'm mapping the observation, which is heat that I get in my hand, to the action, take my hand away. I am not thinking at that point. I am not analyzing the situation. I am not really, and it's just a reflexive thing because I have learned this particular rule over time. Okay? This agent can act quickly. It's also a very important agent, obstacle avoidance. If you are building real robots, almost all obstacle avoidance uh, uh, components in the real robot are reflexive because if I kept going forward, I'll crash into something or somebody which I don't want to do. So as soon as I sense that there's an obstacle, I back off. That's a reflexive action. You can start designing more complex agents. So for example, this is a reflexive agent which has an internal state. So now this did not have an internal state, right? It was mapping observations to actions. This has a little bit of processing. It is saying, I know what the world was like. I know how the world evolves. I got 
some sensor information and based on that information i can predict what the world is or should have is likely right now so that processing i am doing internally so i am maintaining some internal system state and based on the observations i am computing the new state okay this will typically happen when you have any dynamic model like dynamic bayesian network or hidden markov model so you have a new state you get a new observation you compute what is the likelihood of the next state it's like markov decision process you know you are partially observable on mdp x not the solving just this part and then uh, based on what the world is and some condition action rules it is taking the next action okay. still this process is telling it that it is not thinking too much the only thing it is thinking is that it is trying to estimate the state but after that it has some rules to take the action right so suppose you learn the blackjack policy completely and now you were given the policy the policy you were not computing the policy you were given the policy so what will you do you will get a new card based on the new card you will estimate what the current state is and then you will look up the policy and execute that action so once given the policy it just becomes a reflexive agent with an internal state now this is the agent we really started from in the very beginning this is the goal based agent i have some goal i want to satisfy and of course this can be both stochastic and deterministic so it will have some notion of what the world was how the world evolves and some notion of what my actions do and now it gets a sensor based on it it figures out what the world is then it thinks it thinks and now i know this is the world i know what my actions do and how the world evolves if i take an action let's see how the world will be like if i took say this sequence of actions or that sequence of actions and based on this analysis based on this thinking process this deliberation it will figure out some action that it should do based on the goal that it needs to achieve and then it will take that action so here this is a goal based agent which is actually thinking this is not reflexive anymore it is deliberative it is this is you know like brain analyzing the situation analyzing the current state analyzing the long term value of taking a set of actions towards achieving a goal however this goal can be converted into utility right <coughs> slightly more general version of it and we have done this in decision theory and markov decision process and so on exactly the same thing says i have a utility function i will do the same processing and then i will figure out how happy would i be if i take a certain sequence of actions so it's no longer will i achieve the goal it is like will i optimize my utility function and based on that i figure out what the action is the final agent that is sort of probably one of the more most general agents at least most general single agents is a learning agent right and again we have done this so it's uh, it's not new information so now it doesn't necessarily know how the world evolves or what my actions do or even what the utility function is like think reinforcement learning it needs to learn how the world evolves how the act what its actions do or what the utility function is so it learns this from the observations and maybe some feedback from the environment or master and uh, based on this it does the same process so this is probably as general an agent that we got to cover in this class but really we have covered a huge spectrum of an agent which doesn't do any doesn't think starts to think thinks in stochastic environments thinks for utility functions learns while thinking and acting pretty awesome So, so this is just telling you the sort of agent architecture, and you know how intelligent <coughs> agents are designed, and we have gotten inside this red box and talked about the various components that are necessary in deciding each of these uh, boxes. So let's move towards wrapping up our whole discussion throughout the ten uh, weeks. <coughs> in the very first class and i still remember somebody after the first class said this is a really flimsy class are, are you going to not teach anything in the whole classes i hope that uh, <laughs> i should beat that <laughs> yeah I, i hope that that person is satisfied <laughs> it's only because of that one person that you <laughs> <laughs> 
Sorry. So we talked about what is intelligence. Sorry? Maybe he dropped the course. <laughs> Could be a she. I don't know the person. It's an anonymous comment. So, uh, what is intelligence? We started with the question, what is intelligence, right? And as I said, it's a, it's all, it will always remain a mystery. At least it has continued to remain a mystery to me as to what is intelligence. But I think we have a little more understanding through these 10, 11 weeks of what are the various facets of understanding, uh, of intelligence. And we talked about whether you know, an intelligent agent should be one that thinks like humans, or whether intelligence is one that acts like humans, or you know, thinks rationally or bounded rationally, or acts rationally or bounded rationally, or act, right? And we sort of, I think, zeroed in on the fact that by using this particular definition, we satisfy a lot of constraints better that also fits into the agent architecture. So the sort of our working definition of intelligence is an agent that acts rationally, no bounded rationally. Now, throughout the course, we have been saying multiple things. So one of the first things that we said is AI is search. All intelligence or artificial intelligence is search. In fact, everything in the world is search. And this has been sort of the operative definition of AI at least until the 90s. And recall, this is not web search. I think you know this one. So pretty much every problem can be cast as a search problem. I think every continuous problem can also be cast as a search problem, but we, we don't usually deal with that many continuous problems. Um, <coughs> right? And what's the search problem? States, actions, transitions, cost, and some kind of a goal. And we talked about various search algorithms. We talked about atomic agents, which will do systematic search, but will not use any information about the uh, domain besides these things. Or a heuristic guided version of it, which will be more informed, it will have some extra knowledge about what looks like a good state, what doesn't look like a good state. And we talked about a general notion of how to compute these heuristics by doing relaxations of the domain. Remember relaxations? I remember being Some of you remember relaxations. And then we talked about local search. Local search was something rather quick, fast, fewer guarantees, no uh, global optimality, but something that scales much better. Uh, hill climbing, simulated annealing, genetic algorithms, what not. Remember local search? Yeah. I think all of you will remember local search. At least all of you who had to do the first assignment. <coughs> right? So this was an atomic agent. This was the general framework from where all discrete problems and solutions will emanate from. Right? And so in that part, oh, one of the search algorithm we did was a general search algorithm called Minimax. This was general because, uh, but in a specific scenario where there are two uh, adversaries competing for the same objective function. Uh, and we, we also learned what, are, what is the general way to reduce some of this search. So uh, prune, prune search. And then in this particular context, we, I think Owen did not talk about uh, how to learn utility functions, which is all right. Uh, but he probably did talk about opening games and end games, right? And this was in the context of chess. Uh, and so this is, and other search methods like secondary search and question search, which are specific for chess. So um, the general algorithm of Minimax was the general algorithm, but then you add a little bit more knowledge from the domain. <coughs> and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a couple of slides. Then the second view that we had in the course, very early in the course, is that AI is knowledge representation and reasoning. It, any intelligent agent has to represent its knowledge, to figure out how to represent its knowledge, and to use this knowledge to reason about it. And pretty much everything in the world is a knowledge representation and a reasoning task. So representing what I know and reasoning what I can infer. Many examples. We did CSPs. That's a knowledge representation language and has a reasoning problem. We did logic. Base this is another way to represent knowledge and reason with it, except in stochastic domain, but it's exactly the same thing. Markov decision process is actually an atomic agent which is representing knowledge using these probability tables and utility functions, and its inference is what action it should take. Same, same, so really everything fits into this knowledge representation and reasoning paradigm because any task that we do ends up like a reasoning task. Some examples, right? So we did logic. So in logic, the representation is a, any kind of a logical formula. It can be CNF, it can be Horn clauses. 
and depending upon what my representation is, my reasoning task, which is deduction, which is finding new uh, facts or proving that a fact is true, can be done by say forward chaining, if it is horn clauses, can be done by resolution. And then we also did model finding. So we did, how, how can I find a satisfying assignment to a particular uh, clause or a formula? CSP, again, any of these things will have what? A representation, language, a reasoning problem, and then some kind of search which is coming in for solving the problem. So in CSPs, the representation is variables, domains, and constraints. Now the reasoning part of uh, a CSP is constraint propagation. I know this constraint. I know this other constraint. Based on these two constraints, what can I infer? What is the next constraint I can infer? So all of this node consistency, R consistency, path consistency, K consistency, I don't know what we discussed and what we didn't discuss, I don't remember, but all of those are some different kinds of constraint propagation. <coughs> and then, uh, how, how do we solve these CSPs? Well, we use search, right? Everything is search. So in this particular case, we use backtracking search and we use some heuristics which are specific for this domain. But this domain is CSP, so it's not like a domain, it's again a general thing, but we are using this representation and the uh, <coughs> value of this representation in the heuristics. <coughs> we also talked about set tree structured CSPs, which will take polynomial time, and this trade off will happen over and over. This happens everywhere, even in theory and in any computational science, that the original problem, if it is too hard, then there will be subsets of the problem which will be easier, right? So, CSPs, if they are tree structured, can be solved in polynomial time. We talked about cut sets also, which converts a problem into three, three CSP. Similarly, search happens inside solving. Uh, CNF formula, what is the reasoning component of it? Pure literals. Unit propagation. Unit clauses. Right? All of these are um, inference that you can do using on your side formula. Then you have to do search. So search will be DPLL. Then you will add heuristics, which will be mom heuristic. You can do local search. Do you see a pattern here? In any problem in the world, I think you can do this. You can find a representation for that problem. Based on the domain, based on the knowledge in the representation, you can find some basic inferences that you can do. You did that for even the... Uh, that solve problem that you had to solve. You did some inferences using degree heuristic, and we'll talk about it. So you can do some inferences, but only some. Your problem is still typically unsolved until then. So what you do, you create a search procedure. You create the search procedure, and then you put in these inferences on top of the search procedure to prune your search. Then you add some heuristic to guide your search. And then you're done. If you thought of good uh, reasoning paradigms, good heuristics, and good um, um, search algorithm, then you, you are very much in the right path. So all of this fits together in this paradigm that you need a representation language, you need a reasoning component, you need a search algorithm, and you need a heuristic to guide. At least all these discrete problems are really very nicely fit into this. And then we talked about some advances, obviously, because you know that's just a starting point. And so I don't think we talked about class learning very much, but we did talk about restarts in systematic search. We talked about portfolios, I don't remember, but we definitely talked about phase transitions and how there's an easy, hard, easy problem characteristic that we observe sometimes. Then we did planning. Again, same thing. The presentation changes, that strips now. You have actions and preconditions and effects, and you know it's first order logic based and so on. Now you can do reasoning on top of it. A polynomial time reasoning algorithm that we learned was planning graph, where depending upon what literals appear at the last level, we can make inferences about whether this planning problem is solvable or what is a heuristic. The, the same reasoning algorithm actually gives us heuristics. And our search algorithm was just a forward state space search. But we probably talked about, Andre probably talked about the fact that you can do it in the backward direction, and people have done local search also. In fact, one of the most famous local search algorithms till today, and the state of the art until two years back, is called FF. It stands for fast forward, 
and uh, it uses a local search algorithm. Not surprising, but not surprising because it scales much better. But by the way, you can use SAT, satisfiability, to solve a planning problem also, and that's called SAT plan. And it used to be one of the top performing planners uh, a few years back. Then we talked about knowledge representation and reasoning. And when continuous variables happen, that this beautiful structure of you know search and heuristics starts looking less clear, although there is all of that happening at but in continuous variables. So the representation we discussed was Bayesian networks. <coughs> And the reasoning uh, problem we discussed was inference, right? So we talked about exact inference, where we have to search through the variables, but not all combinations, just you actually go through the variables in one order and do eliminate. And then we talked about approximate inference, uh, usually, uh, specifically the sampling based methods. Another kind of knowledge representation and reasoning was decision theory. Where the representation has actions, probabilistic outcomes, and rewards, and the reasoning was what is the expected value, what is the expected value of perfect information. Right. Similarly, we did Markov decision processes, where the representation is states, actions, probabilistic outcomes, and rewards, and the reasoning problem is I want to maximize the long term reward or reach the goal with minimum cost. And there, uh, we did value iteration algorithm. Although there's an equivalent algorithm called policy iteration that we did not get to cover, but it's very close. What we did not get to cover is that we can add on to search, we can uh, add search of states in the context of Markov decision processes, and that's an extension of A star algorithm called LAO star, which we did not get to cover. But the same ideas of states and search actually show up again. Then, towards the very end of the course, we finally started talking about learning, right? So the model was given to us and we were doing inference and reasoning only up until then, in various contexts, stochastic, long term, short term, all of that, but still reasoning. Now we said we have data to start from, now let us do learning on top of it, first learn the model. And in that context, we talked about maximum likelihood estimation, so we did very little of that. We talked about estimating probabilities for Bayes nets. In that context, we did maximum likelihood and maximum Bayes posteriori and Bayesian learning. And if we have in hidden data, we talked about expectation maximization, which is just another form of local search. And in structural learning, we talked about, again, some kind of local search. And very finally, we talked about reinforcement learning, which is one of the sort of all encompassing problem, at least in a single agent setting where you want to learn while you are acting, so you have to take your actions so that they aid in learning, they aid in reward maximization, and all of that. And in that context, we said, should we learn the model first and then do planning on top of it, or should we just not learn the model, just directly learn the state to action mappings? So if you go back to the agent architecture, right? If you go back to this architecture and say, here, I have learned the model. So if I'm learning, I have learned the model. Now I will think and figure out which action should I do. That is model-based approach. This is model-free approach. What was, uh, in Q-learning, what I'm learning? I'm learning the value of action in the state. So in some sense, I don't care for how the world evolves. I, I will just learn this condition action table that is mapping me from the states to the actions. This is again in the, after reinforcement learning, if we have done Q-learning, we would make a reflexive agent. If uh, uh, we have learned the model, then every so often we will do planning component and that will make us a utility-based agent, not reflexive. So it all sort of comes together in one way or the other. And then we did the a discussion of exploration exploitation trade off, which is sort of at the core of the enforcement work. Some of the major themes that we talked about, all we did not talk about but should have talked about. So, first of all, weak AI versus strong AI. Weak AI means <coughs> that I want to build general purpose algorithms. 
which will solve every problem in the world. Almost never will they scale because the problems are computationally high, right? It has been proven to us. Strong AI said, I'm going to use some kind of knowledge from my domain that will help me in reducing the computation. So it's a computation trade-off. If I don't give that knowledge, yes, such algorithm will solve it after a billion years or more. If I give it a lot of knowledge that I already have about the domain, I can reduce my search space and still get high quality solutions. So when we talk about using coescent search and you know uh, all of these heuristics in chess, that is giving knowledge to build a really functioning and you know well-playing agent. But when we talk about Bayes nets or Markov decision processes, these are absolutely general paradigms, very general problems very general solutions, typically much harder in complexity classes. What we did most of in this course, now if, if you think about it, is that in the class we did a VK. We did not give him much knowledge. We said let us do general purpose algorithms that will apply to many scenarios. But then when we did the assignments, we did strong AI because now you had a real domain, <coughs> you had real data, you could think about how to model it as a search algorithm which is the first step but then you thought about what knowledge can I put in in making my agent perform well. So your degree trick in sub subgraph isomorphism or your good starting point based on the combinatorial options or your specific things that you must have done for blackjack, I've not read your assignments yet, would all be ways to give knowledge to the system so that you save on the computation. Yes? Is the exam going to be strong AI or weak AI? Is what? The exam. <laughs> You'll find out. Most of the exam will be weak AI, but we'll talk about it. Right? So this is very common. You have a new domain, so if we did an NLP class, you will use base nets throughout the NLP class or conditional random fields, but then you will add in properties of language in order to make NLP work well. If you did a vision course, where you have given an image, find out which is dog, what is a tree, how to segment, what is the outline, whatever it is, what will be the basis? Bayesian networks, Markov networks, conditional random fields, but then you will use the knowledge that it's an image, there are pixels, pixels are related in a certain way, people are not discontinuous, and all of that knowledge will go into solving vision problems. If you did robotics, exactly the same thing, you will use the knowledge for the robots using general purpose algorithms. So what we learned in this course is a starting point to do, go in any direction, whichever, whatever thing you, you do, you have the basis, at least in my world view, now you put in knowledge from your domain, model it as an AI problem, put it in knowledge, and you might get to a very nice solution. There were many questions here. Yes, Paul. Uh, what property are they talking about when they say it's weak or strong? What's the level of definition? Yeah, so uh, what, what, is, uh, what is given to you? If the only thing that is given to you is the sort of the search representation, states, actions, transitions, it's really weak, yeah, I have not told you much. So weak prior knowledge versus weak prior strong knowledge. Weak prior knowledge versus strong prior The other, another thing that we talked about is that AI field, especially weak AI, loves general purpose tools. Absolutely loves them. CSP solvers, everybody has made CSP solvers. Microsoft has one. SAT solvers, everybody has made SAT solvers. I'm sure Microsoft has one. <laughs> Pretty much everybody has made BaseNets. They, some people have made classical planners. There are even MDB planners that are available. We have made, I have made an MDB, I mean, Andre has made some MDB planners. We love making these general purpose codes, which has a lot of knowledge built in of that, do, uh, of that representation, not the domain, representation. You can start from there. You don't even need to write your own code. You can start from somebody's software, but then you need to know what the code is doing and where do you inject knowledge. If you can do that, then you have a very strong starting point for any problem that you may have. Another thing that we learned is syntax versus semantics. So syntax is what can I represent 
semantics is whatever I can represent, what does it mean? Right. Another thing that we learned is the trade-off between logic and probability. Right? This has been very historical in terms of what kind of problems AI attacked once and what kind of problems AI attacks now. Logic has been more or less discrete. Probability brings us to the continuous form. In logic, if you do hill climbing, in continuous domains, you do gradient descent, same thing. In logic, you may do set solving, in probability, you do Bayesian network inference, very similar. Here, there are tree structured CSPs which are polynomial, here, there are poly tree Bayesian trees which are Bayesian nets which are polynomial. They have cut set, they have probabilistic cut set. Classical planning, factored MDPs, same thing, just the probabilistic worldview. Bellman Ford algorithm for shortest path, value iteration, same thing. A star, LAO star. Basically, this parallel will keep showing up. I mean, not always, but it will keep showing up every now and then. You solve something in the discrete world, you, you find often it is relevant in the continuous world. Question, Abhishek. Sure. Why do we call probability a basic inference as continuous? Because probability. Yes, yes, yes. So, I mean, Bayesian network, I, I used continuous because we have some notion of continuity there. But then you can go one step further and say your, your probability distribution is over continuous state spaces. That is where statistics usually shows up much more because they deal with this all the time. So you have a distribution probability density function between 0 and 1. So that's even one step further. And that's also probability distribution. So therefore, the point, the reason I called it continuous is because there is a continuous component in there. But it has a discrete component also. And when you do control theory, the discrete component sort of goes away or gets reduced significantly. So we are mostly than a discrete component. By discrete component, I understand that we have a random variable which is discrete and then low Fair enough. Fair enough. No, I agree. So there is one step further here where the random variable is continuous and you have a probability distribution on top of it. Finally, we touched some of the advanced concepts in here. We talked about factored states and actions. So CSP is some kind of a factored state. Classical planning is some kind of factored state. We are going inside the state and putting a representation into it. We did not talk much about hierarchical decomposition, but in decision making you have a hierarchy of actions. At the, even if we are, we are building a robot, in fact, when people like us, you know, we take decisions hierarchically. We figure out a long-term decision, then we break it into pieces, get to the next layer, then we break it into pieces, and get to the pieces, and then each little step is sort of acting at the lowest level. So even when people design robots, they have very la many layers. A layer that is reflexive, a layer that is dealing with the continuous sensors and doing that processing. One step up, you abstract it away, away forget the real continuous sensors, get some high-level states, and the topmost level is sort of the brain, which is thinking, what is the long-term action I should be doing? What should be my goal? All of those things lead you into hierarchical decomposition. One of the things that we actually stressed a lot on in this particular class was sampling. Sampling in systematic search, sampling in uh, inference, Bayesian network inference, and sampling in uh, Monte Carlo planning and uh, reinforcement learning. This is a theme that is very common in recent AI trying to approximate these really complex algorithms through sampling. We talked a little bit about context sensitive independence, that as soon as we set some variables to something, suddenly everything becomes independent. That happens in the context of you know backdoors and backbones. That happens in the context of cut sets. And then we didn't talk much about combining probability and first order logic, like Markov logic networks and probabilistic relational models. But that is also because we didn't even talk about first order logic very much. So whatever we did in propositional logic, you can do resolution in first order logic, you can do you know, assignments in first order logic and so on, and then you can add probability on top of it, but that becomes too detailed for us. And then there's a lot of AI that we didn't touch, right? So we didn't talk about hidden Markov models, Kalman filters, basically dynamic factored representations. We didn't talk about ontologies. When you read the text and convert it into some, you know, representation, hierarchy of concepts, word net, all of that. We didn't talk much about robotics, we didn't talk about vision, we very barely touched text. In fact, text and all of these things for the web, I, I, it's become huge, right? Page rank algorithm and 
uh, how do I do information retrieval, all of these things are really, really awesome. And if we had a semester long course, we could have done much more. There's also issues with mechanism design. If there are game theoretic components, many agents trying to compete against each other, what should be my strategy? What should be my mechanism so that the agents are truthful? One of the famous ones is eBay, the weekly auctions. That if I bid for $100, if I win, I will not pay $100. I will play the $1 more than the person who was the second bidder. That allows me to be truthful. That mechanism called weekly auctions is a truthful mechanism. I don't have any reason to be false, to lie my actual utility of that object. Because I will not pay my actual utility, I will pay the utility which is one more than the next competitor. We touched on neuroscience and you know there's just too much. Sensor networks is pretty awesome. I was thinking I'll do a little bit of it. Suppose I have this room and I can only place two light bulbs. Where should I place them? If I can place three light bulbs, where should I place them? And how do I even compute these things because these becomes empty hard. Pretty awesome this stuff. Uh, some really uh, new cool ideas for say some modularity have shown up <coughs> in this context. But we didn't get a chance to do this. But here's, here are the last thoughts I would like you to have before we end this discussion. AI, in my view, is an application driven field. Yes, there is a lot of weak AI that we have developed. But really, we are excited by real credible demonstrations of intelligence by an intelligent agents. So in practice what happens, as soon as we start doing strong AI, is that we are happy, really happy, to beg, borrow, steal ideas from anybody. Control theory, if we have to deal with real robots. Operations research, if we have to deal with numeric variables. Of course, we have our own problems in discrete AI. Uh, computational linguistics, if you have to solve text problems. Um, I mean, the, the, the list just goes on and on. So, depending upon which economics, depending upon which field we are applying in, you know, we are just happy to get their ideas, other ideas, put in our ideas, and find credible demonstrations. So, it's all about the application, not really about the techniques. Of course, we have some concepts and some built-in framework, you know, in the way we think. As I said, traditionally discrete, uh, traditionally logic, but things have been changing. Recently, with a lot, lot of continuous variables, there have been close connections with electrical engineering, status, stat, statistics, um, OR, and, so and it's a huge field. You know, two AI people may not have the same vocabulary because they, uh, somebody works in robotics and I work in language. No connection. And then some people just have fun thinking about what should be the ethics of robotic agents, what are the laws of robotics. People are worried about AI replacing people's jobs. Yeah, I mean, it's a reality. And uh, my view is, is it any different from industrial revolution? So when industrial revolution happened, a lot of the people who were doing the actual work, they got out of jobs. But the next generation, we learned, and as a community, as a whole uh, sort of mankind, we made progress. So if AI is replacing people's jobs, yes, one generation will not be happy about it. Second generation will actually start making uh, stronger progress. And the biggest challenge that AI faces in practice is the privacy concerns. And I'm sure Bing faces that and Google faces that. As soon as you have humans, uh, machines, reading freely available data on the web uh, or um, using our personal information for say health diagnosis or uh, Gmail, Gmail reading our news, we, we all know all of this, right? Then, you know, life becomes tricky. What is the dynamic thing? Dynamic thing? Like, is I'm thinking. These are the slides I made two years back. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the question here is, what is the ethical use of technology? So, bomb is, bomb can be used ethically in a dynamite setting where you are trying to, you know, blow away part of the mountain to make a road and bomb can be used in killing people. So th there is a notion of whether technology is value laden or value neutral. But it is very well understood that the usage itself of the technology is definitely value laden. And so the question is, uh, what is the right use of AI and what is not good use of AI are the questions that people who work in ethics think about. I don't know what speech understanding is here in this context. So this is the last slide. And this is the way I think of the world. 
So to me, at least, AI is, a, is at the center of pretty much everything. We have connections to everyone in different, uh, in different uh, applications, in uh, some of our techniques, and so on. But AI is in the middle, and that is sort of the view I try to project throughout this course. And I don't know how many of you will agree with it after the course is done, but uh, this is the way. Okay, so uh, this is sort of the wrap up. Any last thoughts, questions? Okay, so our course is done. Yeah. <laughs>